place on your seat. Let me open us in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your kindness. Our worth, not on the basis of our seeking you, but on the basis of your own faithfulness to your own character, your own purposes. You are not obligated to save us by anything in us. And yet you have obligated yourself to keep your own promises. And we count you as faithful. And if you were not faithful, if you were fickle, if you could change in your character, purposes, promises, uh, then we would be utterly at a loss. We thank you that you are faithful and that we can count on all that you've said. We pray in our study uh, this week and next of your people, Israel, that you would grow our confidence in you, that this would have practical import for us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I'm hearing a little bit of ringing. Are, are you hearing ringing? Okay. Let me know if I need to switch to the pulpit mic and I'll do that. This morning, we're beginning a study of Israelology. And if you pull those syllables apart just a little bit, uh, it is a study of Israel. And this is properly a study of systematic theology. Systematic theology is that branch of theology where we take everything the Bible says about a subject and systematize it, put it together, kind of look at it from every angle. Uh, there's, a, there's a way to look at individual texts and draw out what individual texts say. And then there's a method of drawing together all the texts, all the threads that deal with a specific topic and look at what the Bible has to say about a topic. And so you can go through the various ologies. Theology proper is the study of God, His person, His being, His attributes. And maybe you've done a study of the attributes of God and looked at who He is and you look at a bunch of different passages related to God proper. Christology is the study of Christ. Angelology, guess, the study of angels. Hamartiology, the study of sin. And on and on and on through all the ologies. There's even a branch of systematic theology called epistemology. Uh, epistemos logos is the study of knowledge. That is, a study of how we know what we know. And yet in all of the systematic theology volumes that I own, there is not a section called Israelology. And this is a problem, I believe. The word Israel shows up some 2,700 times in your Bible. And systematic theology textbooks ought to have a section titled Israelology. It's one of the most prominent threads, themes, topics in your Bible. You encounter it everywhere you turn in your Bible. So it's important for us to sort of put together not just one text related to Israel, but make an attempt of a survey of a systematized view of what the Bible has to say about Israel. And if what I've said already, that the word Israel shows up 2,700 times, if, if you think that we need to take an equipping hour and look at all 2,700 uses of the word Israel, you're correct, that's what we're going to do. No, we're not gonna do that. Uh, we're gonna summarize and systematize what the Bible has to say about Israel. And, and the way I'd like to do this is to think about Israel in terms of past, present, and future. That's gonna be our outline for the coming weeks. What is Israel's past? Uh, what did they do? How were they formed? How did God interact with Israel in the past? That's recorded for us in scripture. And then we'll look at Israel's present. And we'll really start that from the time, we might uh, time that from the triumphal entry of Christ when Israel as a nation rejected Messiah, maybe from the crucifixion, maybe from Acts 2 with the birth of the church. But wherever we start the present day of our relationship to Israel, uh, that will bring us all the way down to 2023, all the way to current. Uh, what is God's view of Israel now? And then we'll look at Israel in the future. Uh, does God still have a plan for ethnic Israel? 
uh, did God make promises that he intends to keep to the same people to whom he made them? Uh, We'll look at Israel in the future. And as we think about that sort of timeline of how we will study Israelology, that should lead you to understand that this intersects with many other ologies that we could study. Uh, This intersects with how we view soteriology or the doctrine of salvation. It intersects with how we view eschatology or the view of the end times. This intersects with how we view ecclesiology or a study of the church. Uh, Very practically speaking, if Israel and the church are the same entity, then the church was the people of God in the Old Testament. And if they are the same entity, then, then the people of God now are a sort of spiritualized Israel. We, we may not be ethnic Israelites, but somehow, some way, if the church and Israel are the same, then, then we, who are mostly Gentiles, are now some sort of Israel. Uh, that's a predominant view in our day. Uh, will that hold up to the scrutiny uh, of the Scriptures? Uh, I, I would say no. And so your, your view of Israelology affects your view of ecclesiology. Is Israel and the church the same thing? Uh, biblically, no, they're not. Israel had a start date. The church had a start date. Uh, They don't have the same birthday. Uh, They're not the same people. They're not uh, under the same plan of God in his plan of redemptive history. Although there's overlap and intersection. We'll look at all of that. And then, of course, when you think about all of these things, a study of Israelology boils down to uh, significant implications for our bibliology. What do we believe about the Bible itself? What you believe about the Bible, is this the Word of God, and does God keep His Word, affects the way we view things like the promises of God to specific people groups. We know from Titus 1 that God cannot lie. Um, What does it mean to understand God at His Word? This is the area of hermeneutics. Hermeneutics, big fancy term, how do we go about understanding a text? What set of rules do we apply in understanding our Bibles? And so what you do with Israelology affects your hermeneutics. If we believe, for instance, that when God made a promise to ethnic Israel, He will keep it in the future, that affects the way we read texts about Israel and about the future. God made specific promises about a people and a land and blessing and blessings to the nation and new hearts for ethnic Israelites. Those things have never yet happened. Those promises have not been fulfilled. If we believe there is no future for Israel, then we have to do something with those very clear and explicit promises. Either they've been abrogated They've been nullified, maybe nullified by the unfaithfulness of man, or maybe they've been transferred to somebody else in some spiritual way. Well, if we begin to do those kinds of things with the promises of God, uh, that affects the way we view the Bible. Rather, if we take those promises, promises to ancient ethnic Israel, as still outstanding promises yet to be fulfilled, That means our approach to the Word of God is one at taking God's Word at face value. Reading language normally, according to authorial intent. What did the author intend? How did the author intend to be understood by what he said? So all of these things become critical for us. And I recognize that a study of Israelology will necessarily divide theological camps. These things are controversial. And they're controversial amongst our friends. They're controversial amongst our friends who love the gospel, who have a high view of God, who love the Word of God, and read it differently. So, just a reminder, when we deal with controversial things, uh, we are bound to the Word of God by conscience. And we are bound to understanding and compassion and patience with others of different views. Uh, recognizing the fact that nobody has everything wired perfectly. Nobody has exhausted a study of the Scriptures in a lifetime. And if we had ten lifetimes, I doubt that we could master this book. But we must, by faith, cling to what God has said. So, 
The attempt of studying Israelology here is to give a, a survey and a systematized look at what God has to say about Israel. Let's look at Israel in the past, and, and we'll get as far as we can here. Uh, we may get into the present. Uh, we may remain in the past this week uh, and into next week. Um, I've got an outline for you up on the screen, and at the, the last screen, in fact, if we could pull up the last slide um, we'll do this now and we'll do this at the end. Here are some resources for further study. I want you to memorize these. I'm just kidding. If you want to take out your phone and take a picture, or if you want to email me or text me, can I get that resource list? However you want to go about getting this, uh, these are helps for further reading. The last one on the list is a journal article that is available. I can email you a PDF. Uh, the others are books. Um, either available through order through the, the book table here at Grace Bible or Amazon or wherever you get your fine theological resources. All right, let's go back to the first slide. I'll bring that up again uh, as we finish out this morning. When we think about Israel in the past, Israel as a nation had a birthday. Uh, we would call this Israel's inauguration. Turn to Genesis chapter 12. The nation of Israel does not go back to Adam. Uh, the nation of Israel had a start point. And if you think through the, the chronology of Genesis, you have man in the garden with God, without sin. In Genesis 1 and 2, you have the fall of man in Genesis 3. In Genesis 4, you have the expansion of man uh, through a series of nations. You have wickedness expanding, technology expanding. You see the vestiges of the greatness of man expanding in Genesis 4, metallurgy, uh, musical instruments, um, but you also have the expansion of sin. Uh, tyranny, murder, polygamy, all of these things emerge at the front pages of our Bible. And, and that leads to the table of, of generations and death in Genesis 5. Somebody gave birth to somebody and he died, and he died, and he died. Just a lot of death flowing out of uh, the fall of man in Genesis 3. Then you have the flood in Genesis 6 through 9. Uh, that's followed up by the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. You remember all of humanity uh, getting together, speaking a common language, and seeking to make a name for themselves, disobeying God's command to spread out, fill the earth, and subdue it. They decide instead, come together, let's make a great name for ourselves, and we'll make our way to the heavens our own way. God came down, smashed the tower. Then you get to Genesis 12, and you have the beginnings of God's dealings with a man and a family and his descendants that would become the nation of Israel. So here we get onto the scene in Genesis chapter 12 with Abram. Now Yahweh said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and so you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So God calls Abram, an idolatrous polygamist out of Ur of the Chaldeans, uh, right near the area where the Tower of Babel had been, and calls him out unto himself. Abraham responds in faith and follows Yahweh. Uh, this is the genesis of this family of people that will eventually be called Israel. Uh, th this can be seen as Israel's inauguration, though they are not named Israel proper yet. But notice what's promised to Abraham, blessing, greatness, a nation, blessings to others through him. Uh, these are remarkable promises uh, God has made. Even these very incipient promises have not yet been fulfilled. Uh, the, the blessing to all the nations, to all peoples, uh, through this has not seen its fullness yet. Turn to Genesis 35.10. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob in the line of descent. Abraham has a son. Isaac has a son. His name is Jacob. Genesis 35.9, God appeared to Jacob when he came from Padan Aram and he blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob, Yaakov. Uh, Jacob, 
means one who usurps, uh, a, a sneaky thief. And do you remember how he got the name? <laughs> he Grasping at the heel of his brother in the womb and then taking blessings for himself. Uh, he's a conniver, uh, one who grasps at the heel. Uh, Jacob is his name. And what does God do? Israel shall be your name. Israel means he who wrestles with God. So Jacob the conniver gets a new name by grace. He wrestles with God. And of course, at this great crisis point in Jacob's life, he meets the angel of Yahweh, who is Yahweh himself, who we believe is the second person of the Trinity before he became a baby at Bethlehem, wrestling with Jacob in the desert and allows himself to be defeated in a wrestling match or at least in a tie. <laughs> and then he cripples Jacob. Jacob walked with a limp for the rest of his life and a new name. Uh, a, a humbling depiction of grace and covenant. Really remarkable statement. And this is where the name for the nation of Israel begins. So if we, if we think together about Abraham and the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then the renaming of Jacob to Israel, uh, you have the inauguration of this nation. Let's move now to the incubation of the nation. Turn to Genesis 15. You know when you incubate eggs and then hatchlings and little chicks, you're, you're attempting to keep them warm and safe and protected from uh, snakes and birds and reptiles and uh, egg thieves of all sorts. Uh, you're, you're trying to cause this vulnerable little one to grow in safety. And we can think about the incubation of the nation of Israel. Look at Genesis 15, verse 13. God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants, and the word there is seed, this is an important word throughout your Bible. It's an, it, tragic that it's been translated to sentence. Uh, you should see the word seed. Uh, that's going to bring all the promises of God from Genesis 3.15 through lineage and descent and genealogies. Uh, this is worth tracing through our Bibles. Know for certain that your seed will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. So on the heels of the promise God made to Abraham, I'm going to give you a land. But know this, uh, your seed will be strangers not in that land, in another land, a land that's not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. God was doing several things there. He was going to make his name great through the Egyptians, uh, we, we find out in the rest here of Genesis 15 that the iniquity of the Amorite was not yet complete. So God was going to let the inhabitants of the land of Canaan fully live out their idolatrous rebellion against him so that they could be judged. That's an interesting theology in that. That, that God is actually going to give them over to their own sin in greater and greater measure as a judgment before removing them from the land by the hand of Israel. Those things weren't done yet. And in the meantime, uh, Israel was just one guy in Genesis 15. And so this nation that God promised would be a blessing to all the world one day uh, is vulnerable, in need of incubation. One of the things God is doing in this time period is taking this fledgling little family and putting it in the incubator of the superpower of the world in that day, the nation of Egypt. Uh, the nation of Egypt ruled uh, that part of the world and its pharaohs and its armies and its architecture and its agriculture were perfect in God's design to let this little hatchling of a nation grow and develop. In the ancient world, uh, a family was vulnerable to marauding bands and armies uh, of bandits, people that would come and kill and destroy and take all your stuff. And God is going to take this little nation, Israel, and put them under the mighty arm of Egypt. It's one reason why when you think about Israel's idolatry later in their history, oftentimes they're like, we want to go back to the safety of Egypt. There is a memory of God actually using Egypt on purpose to keep Israel safe. 
Turn to Genesis 47. Genesis 47, 11, we discover Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had ordered. Here we have the fulfillment of what was promised to Abram in Genesis 15. And, and if you read the end of the book of Genesis, you know the Joseph narrative and the, the brother uh, taken off in captivity and slavery to Egypt, eventually is able to bring the whole family uh, so that all of those who belong to Israel at this point, all the sons of Israel, all the sons of Jacob who became Israel, find themselves now in Egypt. Look at Exodus chapter 12. Verse 35, now the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, for they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing, and Yahweh had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have their request. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Remember all the way back in Genesis 15, God promised Abram that you'll Go and be enslaved in a country. You'll be there 400 years, and when you leave, you'll have many possessions. Now, when you read the Exodus narrative of Israel coming out of Egypt, this is the last thing you'd expect. Wait, the, the Egyptians are going to think kindly of the Israelites? Wait, aren't they the reason all these 10 plagues have come upon our nation? Aren't they the reason we're having all these problems? And what does God do? overwhelms the political situation and the PR and the media in Egypt and gives Israel this wealth of possessions on their way out the door of Egypt. He has faithfully incubated this nation, faithfully protected them, cared for them, and grown them. That leads us to Israel's population. Look at Genesis 46 and verse 27. Now we'll look at verses 26 and 27. All the persons belonging to Jacob who came to Egypt, his direct descendants, not including the wives of Jacob's sons, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two. And all the persons of the house of Jacob who came to Egypt were 70. So how big is this nation that God has big plans for the world for as they come into Egypt? 70 people. Turn to Exodus chapter 1. Verse 5. All the persons who came from the loins of Jacob were 70 in number. Joseph was already in Egypt. Joseph died, all his brothers in that generation. But the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied. And they became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. And scholars tell us there were greater than 2 million Israelites by Exodus chapter 3, the time of Moses and the Exodus. So you go from 70 to greater than 2 million. And you see God is building a, a mighty nation here. Of course, after the Exodus, Israel ends up in the wilderness. Turn to Exodus chapter 19. And in the wilderness, in the Sinai wilderness, uh, they are given the law. They are given the covenant, what we would call from the New Testament perspective, the old covenant. It is the Mosaic law. Uh, we might call this Israel's constitution. Here they are constituted. Uh, they enter into an agreement with God who is their king. They are to be his servants. They are going to represent him as a kingdom of priests to the nations. That is, their job is to be an intermediary. Do you want to know the one true God? Uh, come to Israel and see him. You're going to see him. You're going to know him. You're going to hear from him because they will become the holders of the oracles of God, as Paul calls it in Romans 2. 
Uh, they are going to be the ones who, who are the receptors of God's direct revelation. They will be the place, the house of God's very presence. And they were to be a transformed people. No other nation was given the law that they were given. And they were given this law, this constitution, if you will, so that they would look different than the world. And, and this constitutional document that they receive, it, it's, it's a series of instructions, some 660 regulations about how to live, uh, governing all of life, from the civil government uh, to the temple operations and the sacrificial system, down to uh, jurisprudence of, of case law and what to do in various situations, uh, criminal justice, uh, and then also how one ought to live his life, down to what you would eat, how you would plow your field, what you would wear. They received the sign of this covenant called circumcision in all the males on the eighth day, so that their, their very physical presence was a demonstration that we are different from the rest of the world. Israel was unique as a nation to stand out as an intermediary between the one true God and the world. Come to Israel to meet with Israel's God, the only God there is. And so this constitution they get begins properly in Exodus chapter 19 with Moses on Mount Sinai. Look at verse 1. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. And when they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. And there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God and Yahweh called to him from the mountain saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant... Then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders. And then from Exodus 19 all the way through the end of Deuteronomy, uh, you have uh, these formal documents which constitute the nation. And they contain the, the laws, the prescriptions for living, uh, they also uh, describe in detail the, the holiness code of being set apart and having a priesthood and sacrifices that set them apart, gave instructions for how to deal with sin, how to maintain a, a relational um, rightness with God, and God graciously determines to put His manifest presence in their midst. Pillar of fire, column of smoke, and then his presence in the tabernacle and eventually in the temple in Jerusalem. And this constitution concludes with the book of Deuteronomy, which is uh, probably delivered all in one speech. Uh, this is a sort of sermonic summary and appeal from Moses just before they enter the land. It's a reflection on all the laws that God gave, uh, his unique identity, Israel's unique purpose in the land and in the world. Uh, this is Israel's constitution. And then we see Israel's intended relationship to the nation. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 8. How was Israel supposed to sit in the world? What was her mission? In 1 Kings 8, this is King Solomon. He is the son of King David. And he is reigning over Israel in Israel's golden era. They are the reigning superpower of the ancient Near East at this time. All the other nations of the world are bringing tribute to Israel. Uh, this is their heyday, their glory days. The best they've ever had it up to this point. Even up to our own day. And Solomon, appropriately, is reflecting on Israel's task, Israel's mission. And the scene is striking in 1 Kings 8. David, who uh, was a man after God's own heart, had sought to build a permanent house for the Ark of the Covenant and for the presence of the Lord. And God said to David, you're a man of bloodshed, you're a man of war. You won't do it, but your son will do it. 
And so what did David did? Just everything short of building the building, he imported all the materials, got it all ready. This was on David's heart. And then his son Solomon uh, takes all of these materials, uh, builds this remarkable building. It was a wonder of the ancient world with perfectly cut stone placed one atop the other and magnificent architecture and gold overlaying everything. This would have been stunning to see. Solomon, as king over the world's superpower, humbles himself before the people and he prays. This would have been a striking thing. A king on his knees, the king who can have anything he wants with the snap of his fingers, is actually saying, I am not the king, Yahweh is king. And he leads the entire nation in this remarkable prayer. Look at verse 22. Solomon stood before the altar of Yahweh in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, spread out his hands towards heaven, and he said, O Yahweh, the God of Israel, there is no one like you in heaven on earth or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing loving kindness to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. Uh, he gives uh, expressed gratitude to God, proclaims God's uniqueness, his grace, his faithfulness. Look down at verse 27. Solomon describes his transcendent bigness. He says, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this house which I have built. So all the people assembled around in the biggest and most beautiful building they had ever seen. Probably the costliest venture to that point in history. And Solomon says, heaven can't contain your greatness. This little, this little box that we put together? Uh, this is a remarkable doxology from Solomon. Glorifying God. And then he leads the people in this prayer. Look down at verse 39. He says, listen, O God, in heaven, your, do your dwelling place. Where does God really dwell? In the transcendent space beyond space. Listen to us. Forgive and act and render to each according to all his ways. Whose heart you know, for you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men. That they may fear you all the days that they live in the land which you've given to our fathers. And listen to Solomon's prayer here in verse 41. Concerning the foreigner who is not of your people Israel, when he comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when he comes and he prays toward this house, here in heaven your dwelling place, do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name, to fear you, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this house which I have built is called by your name. And then he talks about sin and forgiveness. When your people sin, when the foreigner sins, God, forgive them. Listen. Look down at verse 56. Blessed be Yahweh who has given rest to his people Israel, according to all that he promised, not one word has failed of all of his good promise, which he promised through Moses, his servant. God, would you incline our hearts to yourself to walk in your ways, to keep your commandments, your statutes, and your ordinances. Remarkable prayer. He knows that there's not a single word of God that has fallen to no effect. That, by the way, does not mean that everything God promised has yet happened. It just means that nothing that God has promised has failed. Nothing has fallen to the ground. Nothing goes unfulfilled. This is a, a remarkable scene. What do we discover here? Israel's task before the Lord was to be a centripetal attraction in the world. That is, if Israel lived faithfully, they lived differently, different than the world. We don't, we don't worship the idols and the gods of the nations. We worship Yahweh. And we live according to His commandments. He regulates our lives so that whether we eat or drink, all is for His glory. The world was to see that and to be attracted to Yahweh. That was their mission. And this mission was Jerusalem-centered. Turn to Psalm 137. 
Psalm 137 is a captivity psalm. Verse 1 tells us, By the rivers of Babylon we sat down and wept, where we remembered Zion. Zion is the term of endearment that God uses for Jerusalem when He is looking at Jerusalem through the lens of affection and keeping His covenant promises and love and grace. Jerusalem gets other names in the Bible. Sometimes it's called Sodom and Gomorrah. But when God calls Jerusalem Zion, He is speaking of His beloved. He is speaking of the city to whom He made promises. And so here in Psalm 137, the the followers of Yahweh are in Babylonian captivity and they're remembering Zion and they weep. Look at verses 4 through 6. How can we sing Yahweh's song in a foreign land? Their captors are taunting them. Hey, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Yahweh's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem... May my right hand forget her skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. What are they lamenting? Jerusalem's been demolished at this point. And and why has Jerusalem been demolished? Because they have not lived up to their constitution. They have not been the kingdom of priests as intermediaries before a watching world saying, there is no one like Yahweh, come here and see how great He is. What have they done instead? They've put on every high hill and under every green tree altars for sacrifice to the pagan gods. Do you remember the the sin of Canaan that hadn't reached its full by by the time Israel went into Egyptian captivity? Well, it had reached its full by the time of the conquest, and Israel was supposed to eradicate the idolatry and the idolaters, and instead they disobeyed God. Those idolaters became a thorn in their side, a temptation before their hearts, and they ended up worshiping all of those false gods, demons. What a tragedy. They're in captivity singing this song in Psalm 137 instead of living up to what Solomon prayed in 1 Kings 8. By the way, how quickly did that transition happen? Three chapters in our Bibles. 1 Kings 8, Solomon dedicates the temple, prays that magnificent prayer. 1 Kings 11, three chapters later, we discover that Solomon has married foreign women and set up altars in Israel to their foreign gods. Altars to gods like Chemosh and Ashtoreth. Immorality, debauchery, and child sacrifice were the practices of worship for those idols. And Solomon set up altars to them in Israel. The slide from covenant faithfulness and glorifying God to idolatry that put them into captivity and dispersion was rapid. And it was persistent. What was their spiritual condition? Turn to Leviticus chapter 26. This is the next point in our outline here. How did Israel do in living up to the covenant? Leviticus 26, 40 gives this amazing, gracious invitation. God says, if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their forefathers in their unfaithfulness which they committed against me and also in their acting with hostility against me, I was also acting with hostility against them to bring them into the land of their enemies, or if their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled so that they then make amends for their iniquity Then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, I will remember my covenant with Isaac, my covenant with Abraham as well, and I will remember the land. For the land will be abandoned by them, and will make up for its Sabbaths while it is made desolate without them. They, meanwhile, will be making amends for their iniquity, because they rejected my ordinances, and their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet, in spite of this, When they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them, nor will I so abhor them as to destroy them, breaking my covenant with them. 
for I am Yahweh their God. I will remember them for the covenant with their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am Yahweh. These are the statutes and ordinances and laws which Yahweh established between himself and the sons of Israel through Moses and Mount Sinai. Where is Leviticus 26 in our Bibles? Little clue. It's in the book of Leviticus. (laughs) We're still in the wilderness at this point in our Bibles. I know we're kind of jumping back and forth here, but there's something you need to understand as you build your doctrine of the nation of Israel. These statements were made in their constitutional period, right after the exodus out of Egyptian slavery, before the conquest, before they're in the land. And what is God talking about? When you're in captivity because you worshiped all the gods of the land, (laughs) you're being punished there because you forsook my Sabbaths, I won't forget you. I'll keep my promises. Why? Because I am Yahweh and I promised. This is really important for understanding our Israelology. There is a view out there that, you know, Israel had her chance and she blew it. And so God is working with a different group today. The church, us. We, we supersede Israel in God's redemptive plan, or even we are the replacement for Israel in God's redemptive plan. Uh, some might say we, we are Israel now in God's redemptive plan. The problem with all of those views is that before they were ever even in the land, Before the temple was dedicated and Solomon gave this great doxological prayer about Israel's mission and God's grace and faithfulness, God knew they would fail. Israel's failure is not a surprise to God as if he needed a plan B and called it the church. Israel's failure was in the plan of God, the foreknowledge of God from before Israel was ever a nation. This is the stunning reality of the constitutional documents and then the historical documents that tell us what happened with Israel and then all the prophetic documents in our Old Testament which said you're in this mess because you didn't remember, because you didn't keep covenant, because you failed. And as we've been going through all those Old Testament prophets on Sunday nights, we discover in almost all of them, really all but one, there is judgment for Israel and there's restoration coming. In other words, God keeps his promises, not obligated by the covenant-keeping faithfulness of Israel, by no means, but obligated to his own faithfulness, to his own integrity. This is critical in our understanding of Israelology. This is one of the reasons that we must study Israel in the Bible. In fact, when we get to the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 9 to 11, we discover how important our Israelology is to our own salvation, to our own assurance and eternal security, banking on the promises of God. We'll discover there, according to Romans 9, 6, that the word of God does not fail which if you've read Romans 5 through 8 and you've banked on all those great gospel promises there, you probably should get to the end of Romans 8 with the no condemnation clause and the no separation clause and the great assurity sandwich of Romans 8 and say, I'm not sure about that. God made promises to Israel. Look at them. They're separated, cut off. And we learn as we study Israel through the Old Testament that yes, There's a period where Israel will be cut off for their unbelief. But that doesn't at all negate or abrogate or change or alter God's promises. Seeing this at the front end, that when they are constituted, God is telling the future about their, their unfaithfulness and God's commitment to his own integrity that will be one day Israel's salvation is important. Turn to Judges 21. After the conquest, after they get into the land, before they have a king, we get this indictment. Judges 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. 
And as you read the book of Judges, you see the downward spiral of depravity into idolatry, rebellion against Yahweh. The enemies would come and, and oppress Israel, and they'd cry out in faith and hope, and God would rescue them, and then they'd plunge into further idolatry. They'd cry out for help, and God would rescue again. Eventually, that culminates in them in rejecting the theocracy where God was the manifest king of Israel. They said, we want to be cool like the other countries, give us an earthly king. And then you begin the period of the kings in Israel. Let's look at the covenants. We'll start this this morning, and we'll pick it up next week for a quipping hour. As we walk through the covenants, we'll look at these covenants related to Israel. The Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, The Mosaic Covenant, I got those backwards. Let's go Abrahamic, Mosaic, then Davidic, and then the New Covenant. A covenant is a a promise. And some of these promises are bilateral, kind of a bargain. You do this and I'll do this. Uh, Kind of a treaty between nations. In this case, a, a, a treaty between God and His people. Some of these covenants are unconditional. That is, they are unilateral. God promises to do something. And those are sort of broad brushes on the covenants. When we think about the broad brush approach to the covenants, uh, which ones were bilateral? What what covenants were, uh, you've got one end of the bargain, God's got one end of the bargain? That would be the Mosaic covenant. Those constitutional laws given We see the agreement that God makes. I'm going to be your God. You be my people. If you do these things and obey, you'll be blessed. You'll live in the land. I'll defend you. You do these things and you disobey, then you will be cursed and I will disperse you. Right? That is a bilateral covenant. Blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience. Uh, We will find out that Israel did not uphold her end of that treaty. But think about the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12. This is a unilateral covenant. God just calls Abram out of his old life, out of his father's country, and says, I'm going to make a great nation of you. I will bless you. I'm going to give you a land and a great people. You'll be a blessing to all the nations. There's no if you do these things. That's a unilateral covenant or an unconditional covenant. Similarly, the promise to David in 2 Samuel 7 is a unilateral covenant, an unconditional covenant. There, God says to David, uh, from your seed will come one to sit on your throne, and there will be a kingdom forever and ever. That is a unilateral, unconditional, inviolable promise to David. And then the new covenant, which is given not only in the constitutional documents, Um, is affirmed in the historical documents and then affirmed again in the prophetic documents is an unconditional covenant that God actually will bring about Israel's obedience and repentance, that he will bring about that which qualifies Israel to live in the land and be blessed. So those new covenant promises actually tie together the Mosaic covenant and the Davidic covenant. In other words, Uh, The the promise of a king and a kingdom and blessings in the land flowing out of the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12 will not happen apart from Israel's obedience in the Mosaic covenant. So we think broad brush, Mosaic is conditional, all the rest of them are unconditional, and within those covenants, I hope this isn't too confusing, there are conditional and unconditional elements. And as we trace, we're going to have to trace through these next week. But let me just give you the heads up. As we trace through these covenants, you're going to find that even in the unconditional covenants, there are conditional elements. Here's what I mean by that. A given Israelite individual who was faithful to Yahweh could benefit from the blessings God promised about prosperity and safety and blessings in the land to certain degrees. And any given generation of Israelites who were faithful to Mosaic Covenant could benefit from the blessings put forward in the Abrahamic and the Davidic and the New Covenants. And 
there is a generation of Israelites coming, still yet future, in which the entire nation will benefit from the blessings that came through the conditional covenants because of God's unconditional commitment to His promises. Mosaic covenants uh, have been fulfilled in terms of the, the cursings for disobedience. The Mosaic covenant has not yet been fulfilled in terms of Israel's obedience and the blessings that come with it. The Abrahamic covenant, unconditional covenant, has not yet been fulfilled in terms of its blessings for the land, a great people, and a blessing to all the nations. The Davidic covenant has not seen its fulfillment yet in terms of a seed of David sitting on the throne of Israel and ruling the world. And the new covenant hasn't been fulfilled yet to the nation of Israel in terms of a soft heart and repentance. By the way, all the new covenant promises have the spiritual reality of a new heart and the physical reality of blessing and prosperity and the physical territory of Israel. You don't separate those things out. So, how will the conditional and unconditional elements be fulfilled and these conditional and unconditional covenants be fulfilled in the future still all at one time? That's coming. So that's where that's going. Uh, next week, we'll look at the covenants in their texts and in their details. Um, and then hopefully next week, we'll also be able to look at Israel in the present. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that you are a God who makes and keeps promises, and you keep your promises on the basis of your own faithfulness to yourself, faithfulness to your own purposes, purposes to reign as king and to get all glory for yourself, purposes that, that find their way into judging sin and forgiving sin of being righteous and holy and just and bringing retribution for unrepentant evil and also a God who is gracious and compassionate and long-suffering and patient and merciful who will forgive the sins of those who turn to you in faith. Old Testament, New Testament, in the past, the present, and the future, you are a God who saves by grace alone through faith alone, bringing about a transformed life and the blessings that go with it. We thank you for being such a God. We thank you that you are reliable, not fickle, that when you have made promises, we can actually bank on them. Increase our faith, O Lord. Help us to understand your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We will reconvene in about 20 minutes for main service. I do. Yep. I'll let you take a look at that and then I'll steal it back from you. There's another one up at the sound booth.